Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and uh, just a couple of announcements. First of all, we have set the schedule for summer semester at the Institute, which does include the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course with our celebrity instructors. That's always when we have the celebs in the summertime like Dr. Neil Barnard, um, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Dr. Mark Schultz, and the list goes on and on. Uh, as always, 39 CMEs, 39 credits for nurses, physician assistants, dietitians, name a health professional, everybody gets credit. Uh, the other thing is my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Kelly Turner, her course Radical Remission went live a few days ago and um, you still have time to get the, the uh, course at a steep discount and I have an extra 10% off code I can give you if you send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. All right, so a couple things we're going to talk about today and the first one is changing taste preferences. People do tend to become really attached to the foods that they eat. And it's not surprising, and let me just give you an example. A person who's 40 years old who just eats three times a day, many of us eat more than three times a day, has consumed 43,800 meals. So it's no wonder that people get attached to their foods. I think you would probably get attached to anything you did over 43,000 times, right? Well, we can all agree that change is difficult, but there are two things I've found really, really help people who are beginning to convert to an optimal diet. The first one is that the reassurance that we can give them that their taste for food will change. I think at the beginning, some people visualize an entire lifetime of choking down broccoli while dreaming of cheese pizza and then keeping in mind how good this is for me and how I'm going to improve my health and, you know, basically using, um, you know, clutch the desk willpower to make yourself do the right thing. Well, this is actually not the case. Studies show that within a few weeks, most people start to experience changes in their tastes and they prefer healthier foods. Not only that, some of the stuff that people used to like a whole lot becomes not so attractive anymore. Now, one example I'll give you, uh, 20 healthcare workers agreed to eliminate added sugars and artificial sweeteners for two weeks as part of a research project. Well, after just two weeks, 95% of them said that sweet foods and drinks tasted a whole lot sweeter than they used to, and 95% said that they would use less or even no sugar in the future after the experiment was over. Within only six days, 87% of the participants said that they stopped craving sugar. Other studies have shown similar results, and one went a step further to show how changed food choices affect or make changes in the brain. This is interesting to me because I'm working on and, um, I'm reading this book called The Mind and the Brain about neuroplasticity and how people can resolve all kinds of things ranging from sensory issues uh, to, um, uh, to actual changing their mind about things like depression, OCD, that sort of thing by literally rewiring their brain. So this is really interesting to me. So to look at this issue, researchers at Tufts University chose 13 overweight or obese people who were enrolled in a diet program and then they had five um, overweight or obese people who just ate normally, whatever that means. Those in the diet program were showed specific strategies for replacing ingredients and recipes with better options options such as whole wheat pasta, lower fat ingredients, that sort of thing. And then they were also told to eat more fruits and vegetables. Those in the diet program were successful in reducing their calorie intake between 500 and 1,000 calories a day. The participants agreed, all of them, to have uh, functional MRI scans done at the beginning and then later on after the study, uh, six months after the study started. Now, during the scan, the subjects were shown pictures of both healthy and unhealthy foods while the researchers looked at bl blood flow to the brain's reward center. During the first scan, before the study actually began, both groups showed increased activity in the Braids Reward Center when they were shown pictures of high calorie foods. But a very interesting thing happened. After six months, those that were in the group who were trying to prepare healthier versions of foods and eat more fruits and vegetables showed increased activity in the reward center when they were shown lower calorie, healthier foods. The scan showed that by making better choices, the patients had literally rewired their brain, brain circuitry, which means that the dieters were starting to have pleasurable responses to eating good foods instead of pleasurable responses to eating foods like potato chips. An additional benefit is while this is all going on, the people in that intervention group lost 14 pounds while the regular dieters gained 5 pounds. These and other similar studies I think should provide some reassurance to people who are starting down this path that this is just not going to be a miserable um, experience based on willing yourself to eat well when you really don't want to. It's a whole lot easier than that. 
Now, in addition to this understanding, I think it's really helpful to provide assistance with structuring a new diet using as many familiar foods as possible. I noticed something a long, long time ago, and that is that those of us who've been doing this for a while become uh, plant-based foodies, you know, all kinds of interesting things to eat that we never ate before. Um, we discover farro and black quinoa and you know, fat-free cheese made from potatoes, and, and that's all fabulous. And we do spend a lot of time experiencing and talking about new food adventures here as part of our culture. But for the new person who just started changing their diet, they hear about that stuff and they think that we've flown in from another planet. It is so far from what they eat. I found that even the people eating the worst diets you can possibly imagine actually do eat and like some healthy foods. So make a list of those foods and start by basing the diet on those. Now, some will obviously be prepared differently. Good example would be potatoes. I find everybody likes potatoes. So of course, we're not gonna have fried potatoes. We're gonna have baked potatoes or steamed potatoes and that sort of thing. Um, even if the list is limited, it's okay. I've structured food plans around six different foods. Variety is a luxury of Western life. It's not required for health. Remember, the average Okinawan is eating 60%, 69% of calories from sweet potatoes. And for the people in Papua New Guinea, the percentage of the diet in sweet potatoes, I think, is almost 90%. So you can be well nourished on a limited number of foods. And I think that um, if a person knows that eventually their tastes will change, they can eat familiar foods for as long as it takes. They can become adventurous later on once the commitment to eating well and good habits are established. So the bottom line is that I think that we can make this whole thing a lot less difficult than it uh, is perceived to be with just using some really smart strategies. All right, on to the next topic. In the history of medicine, we see a lot of recurring themes. One of them is the tendency to become enthralled with new tests, drugs, or procedures before they've been proven to be safe and effective. And the other is that new is always better and more is always better. The more information you have, the better health outcomes you're gonna get. Well, that's certainly what's happened with genetic testing, particularly genetic testing for breast cancer. Now, the promise of genetic testing for breast cancer is that it would lead to more tailored treatments based on the patient's genetic makeup. It actually sounds like a great idea. Uh, I think I'm gonna to prove to you it's not. Two types of genetic tests are becoming almost standard practice, unfortunately, for breast cancer patients. One is to see if the patients have inherited mutations that predispose them to develop cancer. And the other is to test tumor cells looking for mutations that cause the tumor's growth. But as of now, it's not clear that inherited mutations are the cause of cancer. Many women who have mutations don't develop cancer. Women without the mutations do develop cancer. And there are usually no drugs that uh, target these mutations identified in the tumor cells. In other words, testing generates a whole lot of information, but no real improvement in treatment approaches. This can be even more frightening to women who are probably already scared half out of their minds because they have breast cancer who are given this information with no accompanying plan of action. Eric Weiner, director of breast oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute has this to say. He says, our ability to sequence genes has gotten ahead of our ability to know what it means. Doctors do tend to become fascinated with new things, as I mentioned earlier, and this has been the case with genetic testing. The problem is since there is no clear advantage to having the information and there are no objective guidelines for actions that should be taken, doctors sometimes misinterpret test results or offer opinions and advice that aren't supported by the evidence, and the patients often don't know that that's the case. Women are sometimes told that they should have prophylactic mastectomy or they should have their ovaries removed or that a dr aggressive drug treatment for their cancer is a good idea. Many mutations are, are labeled as, for example, variation of unknown significance, which is another way of saying we don't have any idea what this means. So why are we spending so much money on this and why is anybody taking a variant of unknown, a variation of unknown significance and developing a treatment plan around it? As with all other diagnostic tests, the more tests run, the more likely you are to find an abnormality. There's about a 5% chance of finding a variation of unknown significance for each gene tested. So the more genes tested, the more things like that you're going to identify. More genes are being tested in accordance with the more is always better philosophy. 
Now to add additional complication, most women with breast cancer have several gene mutations, not just one. At this time, we just don't really know which one is the one that matters or which ones are the ones that matter. Billions of dollars have been spent trying to figure this out, and there's really only one exception, which is Gleevec. Um, other than that, there have been no successful treatments developed for cancer based on genetic mutations. According to Dr. Tom Seyfried, author of Cancer is a Metabolic Disease, almost 700 drugs have been developed for the purpose of treating gene mutations and have failed in clinical trials. This might be why Norman Sharples, uh, Sharpless, director of the Lineberger Comprehensive um, uh, Cancer Center in North Carolina, says that only one in a thousand women with advanced breast cancer will benefit from treatment with either approved or experimental drugs based on their gene mutations. Fortunately, there seems to be some growing recognition that this is a problem. Um, a lot of the information for this particular article that I wrote came from a story in the New York Times. And the Times has a big subscriber base, and not that it's the best authority on health. Um, there are some good articles, they do get a lot of attention, and so I'm hoping that this will result in more patients saying no to the recommendations for gene testing. But I actually think we might be debating the wrong issue. It's one of the reasons why I asked Dr. Seyfried to come and speak at our conference this year in November. Um, he's a geneticist that says that genetic mutations are not the cause of cancer, but that genetic mutations follow after a cell becomes cancerous. That's a whole different thing than what we're researching right now. He presents a lot of evidence for his theories in his book, and he says that this may be why so many attempts, hundreds and hundreds of attempts that have cost trillions of dollars, have failed to produce meaningful improvements in care. Well, the problem is that research and medicine have become fully invested in the gene theory of cancer. The researchers who pursue the theory are much more likely to develop um, uh, good research proposals and qualify for funding. And the train has left the station in terms of doctors. They jumped off the cliff a long time ago, already having determined, based on not much evidence actually, that genetic testing and the genetic relationship, or the relationship between genes and cancer, breast cancer, are very, very real. Um, to avoid harm, I think that the only thing, I've said to say this about everything, I don't think we're going to see the medical profession dial itself down about this issue. I think the only thing that's going to make any difference is when patients just continue to say no, more of them continuing to say no. One of these days, these centers will have to change their ways because there just won't be anybody there for them to treat. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.